Have you suddenly been overcome with an irresistible urge to wash your potato? Have you begun to open your eyes and are trying to figure out what the hell you see around you in this world? Well, you're in the right place to find out. Are you the hundredth monkey? Prepare yourself for a journey with Tom and Ramon as we continue our search for the hundredth monkey on the hundredth monkey radio. Yay! <laughs> Yay! So here we Welcome are. To the hundredth monkey. Uh, before we get into our guests, let's uh, talk about a few things. Um, so today is the last day to sign up for the subscription for the special that we have. So sign up so you can get the second hour. Yeah, this I is know, a. It's, I know. I hear the booze. booze. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah. Well, hey, it's a pretty good deal. If you look, you look out what everybody, what what these other shows are charging and stuff, and and uh, you know we're still keeping our first hour content, you know, free for free to charge for everybody. Uh, but in just looking at what everybody else is charging compared to what we're charging, it's. Uh, I mean. I mean, a cup of coffee a month is all we're asking, basically. So, anyways. You still suck, boo. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we got to pay for this somehow, Ramon. You know, we 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 put up quite a bit of, of time, energy, money. Well, uh, collecting you know, cans was doing this. good well, for I, us. I mean, we do it regardless. I mean, we love doing this. And we... Uh, yeah. Oh, also, um, we have the merchandise store um, is up. So check that out. See if you find anything interesting. We got a pretty big selection of uh, different types of shirts and oh, hats and coffee cups and all that kind of stuff on there that you can you can choose from. Yeah, I'm gonna um, widen the range and make it uh, bigger to add more stuff to it, uh, especially now that the winter is coming. Um, add some more stuff to it. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, let's see. Uh, pop on over to the website, guys. I mean, we've got a lot of good stuff going on there. Uh, we've, we've been pretty busy recently and haven't uh, been uh, adding a whole lot of stuff into the news or the video section. But uh, uh, when, like Ramon said, winter is coming, and uh, that keeps us indoors a bit more. So uh, expect to see quite a bit more action going on there. And uh, oh, oh, Make see. sure you sign up to um, Twitter if you're a Twitter person, uh, we have a Facebook page, and uh, Tom's YouTube page. It's all on the homepage, so you can find it there. Yes, also, uh, our Dam and Her trip is really shaping up to uh, look like we're going to have a pretty good crew going, so uh, take a look at that. That's uh, going to be the end of May next year, and God, I, I can't wait. That's going to be such a blast. It's going to be, uh, to be in Italy, eh? Yeah, Italy. I've never, actually, I've never been on, off of North America, so. Uh, you know, Except for that time with the ship. Well, yeah, well, that's that wasn't on the earth, so. You know, but <laughs> All right, let's okay. get into our guest. You're babbling. Now. All right, so who we got, Ramon? <laughs> so the guest we have on tonight needs no real introduction been on before and i'll give you a hint is the person who comes on right after us uh if you haven't guessed then this means this is your first time listening so you can listen to the archive dr brooks welcome to the show oh um, thank you so much ramon and john come on this is like you guys are are what makes X Squared Radio great because you bring in all the listeners so that when I come <laughs> on the radio, it's easy. Oh <laughs> boy! Yeah. So I I didn't read your profile because if not, that would be the whole two hour show, and then you know, <laughs> such a long list. Oh, that guy. Yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> that underachiever guy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah he's such a slacker. Yeah. <sighs> Oh, so we wanted to to start out tonight, Brooks, talking about uh, the uh, the, uh, the car company. How's that? How's things going there? Well, you know, uh, when I worked with the major car companies, it was always a challenge. We kind of rode the roller coaster of car sales. When sales were good, everybody at you know GM and Toyota and Nissan was happy. If uh, car sales were down, it was time to slash the budget and cut back, and you know, no overtime and no capital improvement projects and it was you know 
you have just had to kind of ride it out. But after 25 years of doing it, you kind of get used to it. You get tough. You you you, you see projects through to their completion. You launch the uh, and some of these are half billion dollar you know car uh, launches like the Altima was about 450 million dollars. So when I got out of the majors and started on my own uh, to build electric vehicles, you know I knew all the things to do wrong because. When you're with the majors, you have a major checkbook, and you think like you have a major checkbook, and so you got to have 500 or 600 engineers working on something. But when you're a small company, you wear many hats, and you work a lot of hours, and you stay focused, and you say, if it doesn't build cars, we're not going to spend money on it. And lo and behold, after two and a half years, we finished our prototype. It was a, it's a great vehicle. It's tough. Uh, it crash tests fine. It's got a lot of room on the inside. It carries a thousand pounds, a hundred miles on a single charge, and it's affordable. So I thought, gee, you know, we have, you know, the best thing since, uh, well, since Slice the automobile. Bread. And if you remember, the, the first automobiles were electric, and then the next automobiles ran on alcohol, and then the next automobiles ran on vegetable oil, and then along came, well, petroleum. And uh, all it took was a few well-placed pieces of legislation. The first one was prohibition, which prevented the private uh, production of alcohol. So there went that fuel. And uh, the other was uh, clamping down on vegetable oil as a fuel. And so the Rudolph diesel was pretty much out of business without petroleum. So ever since then, and then we're talking about pre-1920s, about 1916, 1917, we've been running on gasoline. Uh, and we've been addicted to it ever since. Now, I look at it maybe not from a standpoint of climate change or, you know, being green or all of that, although that's a good motivation. I look at it from the standpoint of being a sustainable society. You know, we, 30, 40,000 years ago, we were hunter-gatherers. We moved with the herd and we picked berries in the spring and, you know, we just, you know, stored up what we could for the winter and salted pork or beef and bison and we made our way as a, as a small a nomadic tribe here and there but then we learned to domesticate things we learned to grow maize we learned to domesticate animals we learned to um, you know work the the fish so that we could net them instead of hook them and we became more productive and we began to settle down and build houses and roads and cities and towns and we became social creatures but here we are in the 21st century and we've done fine on everything except energy in the form of energy we're still hunter gatherers yeah and yes our hunting techniques have become more sophisticated we use satellites and drills and dynamite and chemicals and you know radio waves and all that and of course don't forget guns we use lots of guns so that we can <laughs> find and keep and capture the elusive oil animal and um, in that sense we have not grown up but there is a substantial community, mine notwithstanding, that wants to domesticate energy. We want to grow our energy. We want to learn to harness the renewable, clean resources of our solar system and maybe even of our galaxy. Why? Because it's the right thing to do. Because it just doesn't make sense to shovel our planet in our gas tanks and burn it. Especially... When we have limited resources, only a few countries have it, and the haves have it very well, and the have-nots pay through the nose for it. You don't have to do that. So you would think, especially with all of the rhetoric that we hear from the bully pulpit from the White House, and not just this one, but the previous one, oh, and the previous one, and the previous and the one, previous one. And, and, <laughs> and the previous four. In fact, if you go back eight presidents all the way to Nixon, we said exactly the same thing. We're addicted to oil. We have to get off foreign resources. We need to become energy independent. Almost identical words over and over and over What's again. That, 30 and, years now? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, since the early 70s, we have been talking oh, about no, getting off of foreign oil. Yeah, almost 40 years. Uh, almost 40 years, because what happened in the early 70s, you'll remember Shell and Gulf and Standard and Exxon, they all controlled the assets that they had placed in the Middle East that drilled the oil, piped the oil, refined the oil, shipped the oil. They owned it all. 
And then a funny thing happened called nationalism. The Middle Eastern countries got smart, and they U.S. And they said, all these refineries, all the steel, all this pipeline, it belongs to us now. Now we're going to become the oil producing economic council, OPEC, and we are going to control the price of oil. Well, when gasoline went up to 76 cents a gallon in 1974, we all thought we were going to die. I mean, I had a 1969 Roadrunner that ran like a scalded cat, but it also got 11 <laughs> miles to the gallon. I, I couldn't afford to drive it. I mean, we thought we were going to die. I mean, we, the internal combustion engine was coming to an end. Yep. And it was 20 years later, in 1993, the state of California passed a, a resolution, a state resolution, a mandate requiring 5% of the commuting fleet in Los Angeles to be electric by 2003. That was a 10-year plan. It was a great plan. And, believe it or not, 100 companies responded to the request for quote. Wow. Now, this is the interesting thing because they all sensed a huge government giveaway. Oh, they sensed this is the pork of all time. And then a funny thing happened. The government came out and said, by the way, there's no money in this. You bring your cars to the EV America Challenge and we're going to find out who's best and that's what we're going to put into production. Guess how many companies showed up? Huh. Four. And only one was Chrysler. Ford, GM, Toyota, what was then Datsun, nobody else showed up except for three independent companies. Those independent companies swept the competition. They were fast, they were powerful, they were able to climb hills, they were able to corner, they were able to go the distance, and they were affordable. And so into production they went, and they started selling and competing against the EV1, which was General Motors' introduction to the market, except that General Motors wasn't selling theirs. They were leasing theirs. So then in 1998, this is five years into the plan. We're supposed to be having a million cars on the road by now. But uh, two things happened. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Department of Energy stepped into the fray and started passing regulations to block electric cars from coming to market. Then in 1998, Pete Wilson decided he wanted to run for president. And when that happened, he needed support. And guess who stepped in? Good old General Motors. Mm. They said, we'll support you if you want to run for president, but you got to do one thing for us. You have to rescind the mandate requiring the fleet to be electric by 2003. And that's what he did. Gasoline was 95 cents a gallon, and that was the end of the electric car until 2008. Well, I got in the electric car business in 2006, and by 2008, I had my first model ready. And they were knocking my doors down. Gas was almost $4 a gallon. Diesel was well over $4 a gallon. And people wanted those electric cars. So I decided that I would sell a bunch of stock I owned at another company, and I would start up production of this vehicle. I was ready to go in full production of a light electric pickup truck in November of 2009. Almost two years ago, we were ready to go into production. Except two organizations stepped into place, the Department of Energy and the NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Again, they blocked electric cars from coming to market. So for two years, we've been working our way through those regulations just as we're about to get a foothold. And believe me, we spent a lot of time talking to congressmen. We've spent a tremendous amount of money and planning and working and submitting applications. One application after another, after another, after another gets turned down, and guess who steps into the fray? None other than the Environmental Protection Agency. Oh. Oh. They pass a regulation banning electric vehicles from the American highway unless, unless the EPA issues, now you're going to laugh at this, the EPA issues a fuel economy label. For the electric vehicle. Wow. What? what? That, right. makes, that makes a lot of sense. Electric vehicle companies have to submit a vehicle 
to the to the uh, Environmental Protection Agency in Ann Arbor, Michigan, no other place in the world, for an indefinite period of time. They will not tell you what the cost is. They will not tell you what the testing protocol is. And when they're done, they issue a fuel economy label for the window of the car. And what it does, it equates the amount of electricity that the car consumes to a gallon of gasoline. Now, that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Uh, I don't, yeah. Now, yeah. now, you can say, okay, well, you know what? Our customers don't care about a gallon of gasoline. Uh, they know that a gallon of gas costs about $3.35, which will get you about, what, 30 miles on a really good car? Yeah. And it will get you about 300 miles in an electric vehicle. And that's all the consumer needs to know. So we're going to go ahead and go into production anyway. Well, June of this year, the Depart the uh, uh, Environmental Protection Agency added a nice little feature to their regulation. A $32,000 fine per vehicle that does not contain the Environmental Protection Agency's fuel economy label on the window. Wow. Doubling the price, doubling the price of the electric vehicle. Wow. wow. To date, only one electric vehicle has complied with the label, and it isn't made in America. Wow. Oh, was there, that the Nissan one? That's the Nissan Leaf. It's made in Japan right now because the batteries are so toxic that it can't be made in the United States. It goes about, <laughs> it goes about 75 or 80 miles on a charge, and it's not a bad car, but it also doesn't Expensive. create any American jobs. Well, there are, there are 21 independent electric vehicle manufacturers in the United States that are American-owned. They build American cars. They're among the safest vehicles ever produced for the American highway, and you can't buy one of them, not in the U.S. This so is... let me ask you a question. If I wanted to buy one of your cars here in Japan, do you, do you get a big headache from it, or is, is it no. the same crap? No, I can sell to other countries. Um, unfortunately, Japan, Israel, and uh, several other countries require the NHTSA certification on the vehicle. Now, we build a light electric delivery truck. You can use it as a commuter if you want to, but we sell primarily into a niche of light delivery trucks. According to the NHTSA, we have to prepare our truck with smart advanced airbags that can tell when there's a car seat with an infant in it in the passenger side, when there's a nine-year-old in the passenger side, and when there's an out-of-place adult in the vehicle. There, there are no possibilities that a car seat will ever be put in one of our trucks. Not in a light delivery vehicle. Most of these will be fleet applications. Yeah. We, can't, we can't get a waiver for that. We have to go through a $6 million crash test development program. We have to crash about 100 vehicles to qualify for these smart airbags. Wow. It's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. And the truck we build is already safer than 98% of the vehicles on the road today. Wow. Wow. Now, you... I don't know if you want to talk about this, and, and if you don't, we can move on, but you were recently in um, Washington. Do you want to tell us more about that? I was in Washington a couple times. Um, Shaking things up, as I remember last. <laughs> well, two weeks ago, I was invited to uh, attend a Department of Defense briefing. Nine electric vehicle companies were invited. Two of them were bus companies. Uh, one of them was a heavy truck uh, manufacturer. A couple of them were, were car makers, and we were the only light truck manufacturer. In this meeting, and there are about 125 uh, of us in this meeting, um, the Air Force, I'm sorry, the Armed Forces had employed some PhD level um, statisticians and experts uh, headed up by senior fellows of Washington University and, uh, and one other university, which I can't remember the name, but anyway, the spokesman got up and explained that they had just finished a five-year study. This is really in-depth because it, they actually surveyed 
carefully 500 domestic military installations. What they discovered is that those 500 installations consume about $4 billion worth of gasoline a year. Whoa. Just, just for driving around the base. Just for, this is not talking tactical. This is non-tactical vehicles. Well, that is a huge burden upon the Department of Defense. The second thing is that 64% of the fuel put in these vehicles comes from foreign sources, which they see as a security risk. I see it that way too. The third thing that they noticed is that all 500 of these installations are connected to the public electrical utility grid. And the grids are now quote unquote smart, which means a electrical producer in Houston can supply a grid in Portland. We can move electricity around the country through these networks of grids. However, mistakes made in one region affect the consumers in another region. Just before we had this briefing in Washington, an operator in Yuma, Arizona, made a mistake on a switchboard, shutting down San Diego for almost six hours. Well, San Diego happens to be where El Toro Marine Base is. It was dark for over four and a half hours. Now, I don't know if your listeners know this, but domestic military bases are now intricately tied to tactical bases. You will have a young man in Alabama flying a drone in Iran or yeah. Iraq live over a satellite link-up. If that base goes dark, you lose that tactical ability. The domestic bases are tied to the tactical mission. So they see it as a mission essential that they have the ability to back up the public utility grid with what they call a vehicle to grid system or a microgrid. Now what this means is that you've got say 200 electric vehicles running around on a base, each one's carrying a 40 kilowatt battery pack in it, and all of a sudden the power goes out. You can alert those electric vehicles to return to the grid plug into the grid and you can actually power the essential services of that base for several days off just the power that's in those electric vehicles. Wow. wow. Now that, that gives national security. Hmm. So in this meeting, they said we operate over 200,000 vehicles domestically in the United States. Most of those vehicles are light trucks. Well, man, my heart was racing about then oh, I bet. because the leader of this study group turned to me and said, there's one company in here, the only company in the entire world that makes a 62 E-class light highway ready electric pickup truck. And they're in this room. That nice. was me. Nice. Did you jump for joy there? Like a little I did. kid? So the next day they invited me to the Pentagon and we went over this entire thing again except there weren't 123 of us in the room. There was one. Me. Nice. Nice. Well, so so then what I'm well, are they going to pay for all your testing then? Or they don't have they'll, they'll have a waiver there. They'll make an order. It's up to me to find the money to build those vehicles. Hmm. Hmm. So you'll still have to have the stickers and all that crap? Well, no, because they'll be factory direct. They won't be sold to consumers. But oh. I will have to have the NHTSA waivers, and I will have to have the production ability. And, you know, you have a, a limit on how much time you can take to produce these vehicles. Right, right. So I'm going to get the order. It's just that such a strange thing has happened in this country since 2008 it's, it's, it's really, it just boggles my mind. Pick, picture it like this. Ten guys come to a poker table to play cards. Each one has a billion dollars. That's a lot of money. Yeah. Well, they play cards for a while, a few days or a month, let's say. And all of a sudden, they get to a point where nobody at the table can ante up. Well, they got to look around and say, wait a minute. There should be, there should be a huge pile of chips in front of somebody here. But there isn't. All the chips are gone. <laughs> what they discover is a bank has been skimming chips off every single pot. Slowly but surely, 
the amount of available chips in the game has diminished to the point the guys can't afford popcorn. That's where we are in the United States of America today. The banking system has skimmed trillions of dollars off the top of the money supply. We don't know what they've done with it. They're unaccountable. They are not elected. There's no audit. It's unbelievable. We're talking close to six trillion dollars that's been drained out of the American economy since 2008. Nobody knows where it is. It's gone. I, th I heard a number quite a bit higher than that. I saw an article the other day that said that $700 billion bailout ended up being, uh, God, what was it, $23 trillion? Oh, my gosh. Uh, it's just, where, where did the money go? Yeah, uh, well, where exactly. Yeah. That's, that's a really good question. A question everybody would like to know. Yeah. So... Let's um switch gears a, a bit and let's move into the uh, space. Okay. Now I was I was looking into the whole thing with the um I was listening to your show uh today. This is being recorded on your Monday, my Tuesday. So I was listening to the show yesterday and the the whole thing with the neutrinos is with neutrinos being faster than light that's being um, investigated here in Japan? Well, this is, a, this is a result of some through-the-earth measurements that are made by shooting neutrinos from one side of the planet through the planet to detectors on the other side of the planet. Consistently, these neutrinos are arriving um, a few dozen billionths of a second earlier than they're supposed to, and it's repeatable. They've done it lots and lots of times. In fact, thousands of times. They admit it's crazy, it's impossible, but it's repeatable, and they published it, and they don't know what to make of it. If it's true, if these neutrinos are in fact passing the speed of light, one of two things is happening. They are actually, without violating the, freak, the uh, formula of infinite mass, they're actually traveling faster than the speed of light. Or... They're slipping between dimensions. Now, this is where I find odd when you said that. Um, and for all those out there who are Trekkies, you might remember this episode. It was uh, Deep Space Nine. And it was an episode where they were saying that from one planet to another, these ancient people had travel. But they didn't have uh, warp drive. So how did they do it? They had a solar sail. And they were saying that's impossible. What it was is that they hit an area that was very high concentration in neutrinos. And when they hit the solar sails, it took them past the speed of, of warp. Um, so they were able to make it to this other planet a lot faster than you would at, at their modern warp speed. So wow. I find that very interesting that this show was 2002, 2001. Yeah, somewhere in there. Yeah. Deep Space Nine. So, when you said that, I was like, ah, I can't believe he doesn't remember that episode. <laughs> <laughs> well, so well, I kind of, I kind of trekked out after Next Gen. I just, I just, I picked up, um, you know, Deep Space Nine for a little while, and I just, uh, I guess the Ferengis or something. I don't know. I just, uh, <laughs> I, I had a big crush on Dax. You know, the 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 uh, oh, symbiote. Did? Oh yeah. my gosh. That was just, and then, and to make matters worse, they got better looking after that. So mm. I had to, uh, because I had kids at home, we had to, we had to watch something else. So, mm. <laughs> yeah, the the whole faster than the speed of light thing, boy, that's that's really going to shake up our whole physics world. Uh, if, if that well, it is. Pro if that it, proves it out, then we're going to be throwing a lot of books away. Well, yeah, that's true, because one of the things that we discovered at CERN, when we, when we accelerate particles, I say we, I'm not involved with the project, but I'm saying we as a physics community, they have, they have four stages to CERN. Uh, first, uh, they strip the electrons off the hydrogen protons, and they accelerate them to about uh, nine-tenths the speed of light. 
And then they go through a series of magnetic accelerators where more and more energy is poured into those protons. Now, they start out somewhere around one electron volt, one electron volt for a proton. By the time they finish the acceleration, they're somewhere around 50 to 60 tera electron volts, TEVs. That's, uh, you know, way up there, 10 to the 12th, tera electron volts. So in when you pour more energy into them, they don't go any faster. They just get larger and larger and larger. Now, the reason that we that much energy is poured into them is the two sets of or what we call packets of protons are peeled off from one another and sent on a figure eight track. And just like a figure eight track in racing, they slam into each other. And when they do, these things are so massive with 50 million million electron volts of energy in them that when they strike each other, they come apart in a shower of subatomic particles. And that's what they're trying to measure. Now, it's an elaborate experiment, and it's, you know, the one section's 27 kilometers in diameter, and it's underground. It'll give you an idea how much money was spent to build this thing. Right. They spent a lot of money to do this, but at the end of the day, it's like a seven-year-old with a mechanical robot, battery-powered, and he picks the robot up and smashes it on the garage floor and hits it with a hammer. So he can see how it's built. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that makes I think sense. It's, it's very impressive what they've done. The whole measurement system is impressive. The mechanics of it is impressive. But you really want to impress me? Build one proton. Just one. Yeah. Mm. It's. Mm. I, I don't know. I. I um... I definitely feel that there's certain other technologies they can be putting that that would probably answer a lot of those questions. I'm not a physicist, so you can correct me. Um, with the whole uh, zero-point energy. Well, zero-point energy is, uh, is, by definition, a point at which no movement occurs. It's absolute zero. Now, theoretically, at absolute zero where nothing is moving, and by the way, we haven't really accomplished it. It, it. it is accomplished in deep space, but we haven't learned to accomplish it here on Earth. Um, at absolute zero, there appears to be charge that blinks into this dimension and blinks back out of it. Um, the original theorist was named Casimir. Now, he couldn't actually create the experiment, because you really have to machine things so flat. I mean, flat within like 25 parts per million flat. When you put these plates very close together, and by very close together, I mean about two molecules apart in a vacuum, somehow there's a charge that blinks into existence between these plates and pulls the plates together. Now, that has been blown into this mystical zero-point energy that people think they can tap into. It isn't useful energy. You would need an antenna the size of Arizona to turn a flashlight on with zero-point energy. There's just not very much energy in it. There's a lot of energy in the atmosphere of Earth, and several dynamo experiments have proven that Earth is like this pulsating power supply and that if we could tap into the magnetic flux around the earth there's no telling what we couldn't power and so that's we what we just haven't figured out how that's to do what it yet. tesla was grabbing right yeah tesla was actually was... using ground potentials and he was lighting light bulbs by screwing them into the ground he had to create a field over the top of the mountain which he did with a giant dc static generator but the current flow from the static generator through the light bulbs into ground, turn the gas to plasma and lit them up. So, so from your point of view, um, you know, we ha we recently had uh, Ralph Ring on the show, and he was telling us how they had built a vehicle and flown it around. Um, so, in your 
I don't know if you're familiar with his work. In your point of view, how is it that they're um, running these vehicles? The um, extraterrestrials or the extra dimensionals? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I, I think that that's the biggest problem physicists have with UFOs and visitors from other worlds to this planet is we all realize that it's virtually impossible, no, it is impossible, to jump into an aluminum can and fly from the nearest star to here. First of all, you'd never find Earth. You just wouldn't. Our sun doesn't even show up from Arcturus. It's so small. Um, the radio waves that we've been generating for, what, 60, 70 years on this planet haven't even reached there yet. So they wouldn't even get the signal until now, and then and it would take them you know, that long to get here. So that's not the way they travel, obviously, because one thing can be observed. They're here. And the other thing that can be observed is they didn't travel eight or nine or 40 or 200 light years across space the way we think it should be done yeah. in a straight line as fast as you can you know pump ions out the back of the ship they had to come another way they had to come between dimensions they had to figure out a way to cut space slip through the fabric of space-time and come out a slit on the other side there are mathematics that say it's possible but we don't have a clue how to do it. Yeah, well, maybe getting rid of this uh, this uh, speed of light barrier uh, and dropping that uh, the the Einstein mathematics out of the picture will uh, open some minds to some new possibilities and looking outside the box. Because I I think our whole scientific community, at least the uh, 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 well, a major part of our science, the, the larger part of our scientific community is stuck inside the, uh, a relatively controlled box on where they can go. I mean, it, otherwise they just don't get the funding to do research, you know. Uh, they can't research well, outside the, the box. The, that's true. That's true. The headwaters of all funding when it comes to energy or propulsion drive is the military. And if, if they don't see a good military application for something, you're not going to get funding for it. If they do see really good military application for it, you're not going to be able to tell anybody about it if you do get the funding for it. Yeah, it gets that secret stamp on it and gets buried in somewhere. Yeah. Now, I, well, it doesn't, doesn't mean that they don't experiment with it. They can't keep their hands off of it. Um. Oh, Tom, help me out here. What's the name of um, there's there's a gentleman from the 1920s or 30s who theorized that light is actually not so much a constant that it's oh, Walter more, Russell. Yes, thank you. That light is not moving at all, and everything else is trying to slow down to its speed. Yeah, yeah. There's um, a really good modern physicist. Um, and he wrote a book called Transcendental Physics. His name is Dr. Ed Close. Um, he and I have had several long conversations. Anyway, as I was saying, he and I had several long conversations. And um, what, what we determined is that there's a way of looking at the universe from the standpoint of a photon. And when you become the photon, or your perspective becomes the photon, the entire universe shrinks back to the singularity. The Big Bang never happened. So it's really human consciousness or the observation of sentient beings that has brought the universe into its average state, which we observe, which we enjoy. Hmm. Wow, that's some interesting stuff. Uh, his last name was Close, did you say? Yeah, Dr. Ed Close, and he wrote a book called Transcendental Physics. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting stuff. Yeah, I, I, I think that uh, I think we're getting to a point uh, where uh, there's definitely some new stuff that has to come into the picture 
for people to be able to just to move move out of this uh, conundrum that we're in, uh, energy and uh, just the whole mess that the whole world is in right now. We there's there's got to be some new stuff that comes in, and uh, well, actually, what we need is is for some of the reins to be loosened. Well, that's it. I mean, we've, you know, from from a domestic point of view, that is to say, businesses in the United States of America and probably Europe for that matter, regulations from people who know nothing about the science, they know nothing about energy, they know nothing about cars, they don't know anything about economics. What they do know about is power. And what they have done with their power is they have completely shut down the commerce of this country. We've gone from number one to number two to number eight. We are now as a nation where the state of California used to be by itself as wow. far as economic power. And the reason that we've done that, and by the way, I don't pay any attention to these unemployment numbers. They say uh, uh, 10 percent or 9.1 percent. It's actually about 10.1 percent officially in the state of North Carolina where I am. Actually, that number is really closer to 21 percent because you're not counting the people that have given up looking for jobs and have opened their own small business, a one-man show of cutting grass or mowing or, or cutting hair or painting houses or cleaning carpets or something like that. And you're not counting the people that are underemployed. These are engineers that are waiting tables. These are, uh, you know, doctors that are... Uh, helping out in free clinics because they can't find any work. Um, you know, you're so right on point. I worked in a bar when I lived in New York City about two years ago, and I was the only one there without a master's. Yeah, Everybody exactly. else, except for the me and the owners, didn't have a master. Everybody else had a master. And I said, are you requiring a master to, to attend bar? He said, you would think so. Hmm. But it was, those it was so master's nice. degrees that are mixing drinks and pouring beers, they don't count on the rolls of the unemployed. Now, the bad thing about this round of unemployment, and by the way, this is the worst um, recovery from than all of the recessions, post-war recessions in the history of the United States combined. This is the worst one. We lost more jobs in 2008 and 2009, um, right after the election, we lost more jobs than we have ever lost in the United States, and we're not bouncing back from it. It went too far. There's not enough commerce moving to pay off debt. That's what, that's what fueled the foreclosure thing. Once the foreclosure started, the banks couldn't resist. They poured tens of thousands of homes at pennies on the dollar on the market because the federal government promised to make up the difference. Well, once those foreclosed homes went on the market, buyers with cash swooped in, just like they did after the Depression in 1929, and scooped up houses as investments. Well, when they did that, they lowered the comparable price of those houses. So people that still owned their homes, that were still making payments on their homes, saw the value of their houses drop to 50% of what they owed. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be the other way around. You're supposed to owe 50% of what it's worth. And so where people found themselves is that they were making payments on loans that were twice as high as the house's value. And rather than file bankruptcy, they just let their houses go back to foreclosure as well, took their cash, and bought another house on foreclosure market. It was like refinancing for them. Hmm. And so the foreclosure market exploded, and it isn't even close to being done yet. We're not even halfway through all those cheap houses being dumped on the market. When that's done... The mortgage-backed securities, which makes up about 90% of most banks' portfolios, will be completely gutted back to about 25 cents on the dollar, especially commercial property. I, I always That's wondered, because in, uh, in New Jersey, they, it was very big 
to go into a foreclosed house because there were so many just popping up. You go in there and you just strip it of all its value, the copper, the wiring. And I, I always wonder if this was almost like, um, like you had professional people doing this, it, it seemed like. Because sure. it, it didn't seem like some crackhead or, or drug addict that was stripping these things. It was somebody who knew what they were doing. <laughs> you know, yeah, that's exactly right. So this is what's called the Depression. You know, the Depression of 1929 was terrible for people who were margined. That is to say, using a dime to hold a dollar's worth of stock. Because when the call came, they were bankrupt. But for people who had cash, people that were merchants, people that uh, had holdings overseas, they came back in and they scooped entire city blocks for pennies on the dollar. By the time the dust settled from the Depression, there were only two classes of people, the extreme impoverished and the extreme wealthy. Yep. Yep, and here we are right again. That divide is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, fortunately, we have a very, very strong middle class, and we have a very informed middle class, and we have the power to vote. Now, if you understand what you're voting for and you don't fall to the programmed rhetoric that you hear on the news and you find a candidate that's saying what makes sense and regardless of what mantra you hear from the 24-hour news channels you (laughs) vote that common sense we can turn this around i i'm laughing because i recently um uh, on the the Onion, anybody knows they do like a lot of comedy style, and they d- had a, a full news report about three to four minutes long, and the report was called bullshit, and it said <laughs> we're, we're reporting a lot of bullshit. Back to you, Tom. And it, 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 they did it so professional and so well done that it's <laughs> <laughs> so, and it just YouTube that one. It's hilarious. But well, I was watching uh, John Stewart the other day, and he was talking about the Iowa straw poll, and then he was talking about the California straw poll, and and you know he was talking about Ron Paul. You know, Ron Paul came in second in Iowa, but they only talked about first, third, and fourth. Then uh, they talked about Michelle Bachman slipping to fourth, but Ron Paul was third, but they didn't mention his name. So it was like. You know, John Stewart has a way of looking at the camera without saying anything that's really hilarious. Mm-hmm. But, but yeah, he's been then he came years. back. Uh, you know, the thing that just blows my mind is that Ron Paul, Carl Johnson, and Herman Cain, and I would say along with Newt Gingrich, are making up a four man um, brain trust that is really turning politics on its head. The factory candidates. Perry and Romney and Bachman and Santorum, those are the factory candidates. But the other four candidates are the common sense candidates. And they're making more and more and more sense. And the news media is just a pile of buffoonery. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I like the way that I, I've noticed that they are completely omitting Ron, Ron Paul from any reporting of any kind. It's, uh, well, they yeah. are. And he, even though he's the third place runner by by all the straw polls, and in some cases the winner, they only give him two or three questions out of the entire debate. They spend all their time on Huntsman, who has less than one percent of the vote. Huntsman will get six or seven questions, but Johnson, Cain, Paul, maybe two or three questions. They might come back on rebuttal, but only if one of the other candidates mentions their name. What I thought was really refreshing is you had a seasoned, extremely, uh, for my money, he's the most educated man in American government, and that's Newt Gingrich. When he said that he would choose Herman Cain and his running mate, I thought that was stand-up. That was very powerful. Mm, I'm not familiar with Herman Cain. No, neither am I. Herman Cain was the CEO of Pizza Hut. So he built a small business into a world-class you know, business. And when he talks, he has a plan. He has uh, logic. He has the ability to speak off the cuff. No plastic screens. 
Um, and and he's just he's just very very powerful. He's got a great tax plan. He's got a great immigration plan. He's got a great Medicare Medicaid plan. I mean, the guy makes sense, and you just can shoot holes in his ideas. Well, you know, I, if we can get just get somebody that can actually follow through with their campaign promises when they finally get in the office, you know, that's that's you know. Hell, Obama would have been great if he would have followed through with all of his promises. I mean... Well, Obama was the epitome of a factory candidate. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But if he he would have followed through with all the promises that he made prior to getting in office, uh, I would be happy as a clam with his his, uh, presidency. Well, I would, too. You know, when, when I went to Washington right after he was elected... It felt like a breath of fresh air. It really felt like things were going to start moving in a green direction. And we were listening to the rhetoric. Our investors were listening to the rhetoric. We applied for numerous Department of Energy grants. And it wasn't until we spent, well, we spent a lot of money, pretty close to $400,000. And we got turned down every grant. But we weren't alone. Every single electric vehicle company got turned down for grants. No one got a penny. It all went to the major multi-billion dollar multinational companies. So we went to Washington. We sat down with the Department of Energy. We sat down with Christine Johnson's staff. And after one and a half days, here's what they finally told us. The Department of Energy has never, does not now, and has no plans to ever give money to small business to manufacture electric vehicles. Small business has no business building electric vehicles. Now, if you want to supply General Motors, we'll give you a grant. But you want to go at it on your own, you are on your own. Hmm. Did you record well, that? What was it? What was this? What's this country built on, though? I mean, isn't that what this country's built on? You would think. Of course it is. It's absolutely built on small business. But when it comes to government funds, it is absolutely positively going. <sighs> to multi-billion dollar corporations. What so happened to gov- government of the people for the people? Well, that's government. That has nothing to do with the bureaucracies. Mm. You want to go and talk to Congress? You can talk to Congress. You can sway them. They'll pass laws. That's no problem. But the agencies, departments, and bureaus make their own regulations, have their own budgets, and they don't answer to Congress. You'd think they would, but they thumb their nose at Congress. Here's what they say. You bring one congressman to the Department of Energy, and they say, you and your temp can leave now. We were here before he got here, and we'll be here after he's gone. Hmm. They look at congressmen as temps. (laughs) Oh, boy. Boy, we got a lot of work. We have a lot of work do. to do to get Here, this place straightened out. Here's what I like about Herman Cain. They asked him, what would be your first act in office? He said, my first act in office would be to dissolve the EPA and start over. Hmm. My second act in office would be to dissolve the IRS. Gone. He has a plan he calls the 999 plan, which is really intelligent. You should look it up. Well, you do those two things... You just laid off 335,000 federal workers. Not bad. That does a lot for lowering the budget. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I I mean, it's it's criminal what they're doing. It's actually it's no different from strong arming somebody. You know. Well, it's unconstitutional. Yeah. The Constitution says that the federal government can't do anything that the that the states don't specifically assign to it. Yep. Yep. And the states the states didn't do this. The states didn't do this. Yep. Okay, well we are zeroing in on the top of the hour here, so uh <clears throat> I think everybody knows how to get a hold of your material. Why don't, why don't you throw your uh website out there brooks and uh and let us know who's uh, coming up next too let's uh let's plug your books too yeah oh yeah and who's on after us (laughs) some some guy who hogs up all the time on the show huh i know i know he talks for three hours and doesn't let anybody get a word in edgewise um (laughs) 
Um, we have, I have five books out, the four book series of the Ark of Millions of Years, which is um, basically 2,000 pages on the origin and destiny of the Earth and everything you ever wanted to know about 2012 and the effects on society. These are the facts. Um, we're quoted in dozens of other publications. When we first came out with our first book on uh, 2012 and 2004, there were less than half a dozen titles on the shelf. Now there's about 200 titles on the shelf about 2012. You can find our, our stuff in almost all those books, our pictures, our quotes, our studies, our translations. And, you know, heaven help them. I, th I think they're doing a wonderful job in getting the word out there. It's called The Ark of Millions of Years, and you can get to it at arcofmillionsofyears.com. My latest book is called Remembering the Future, The Physics of the Soul and Time Travel. It is a self-help book for making wealth using mathematical and physics principles. And it's easy to understand. It's a trip and a half. Yes, You'll it enjoy is. it. And, and your life will be better for reading it. Mine was for writing it. I I I, I, I will at, uh, agree with that one 100 percent. Well, I, I appreciate here, here. that. You know, I I wrote the book, and um, you know, I'm an independent uh, publisher. I published the book myself, and five days after it came out, it was number 29 on Amazon, and it's been holding its own. It's, it's been in the top 100 for over a year. So it's really, really doing well. People like reading it. It's an easy read. But if you're not a good reader, don't worry about it. I read it for you. If you buy the book from my website at rememberingthefuturebook.com, you get the audio version for free. Great. Yay. Good stuff. So who do you, what do you have coming up on the show? Give us a little glimpse. I don't know if you... Um, well, I, I wish I could. <laughs> <laughs> I have a I have a couple of guests coming up. Um, they're kind of hard to nail down. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to get uh, Jim Stone to come on the program. He's a fantastic investigative reporter. Very difficult to nail him down and have him come on. Um, I'm also uh, going to have Ed Close on the program here shortly. Um, a couple other writers I just got done reading. I'm not going to have either one of them on the program. They just, they just don't know their material well enough. Um, coming up in December, we have the Pythagoras Conference. Hey, this conference is in Louisville, believe it or not. Can you believe it? A Midwest conference. It's not in California? 20... <laughs> nope. It's not in California. It's not out on the left coast. It's in the Midwest, in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, December 21st or December 18th, I think it is, December 18th, um, at the Golf House, which is like the most prestigious place to have a conference you could imagine. But you can drive to this place. It's, it's smack dab in the middle of 73% of the population of the country. And we just don't get conferences like this in the West. So check it out. It's extremely affordable. They're, they're given two for one right now. Uh, go to xsquaredradio.com, click on the Pythagoras Conference banner, and sign up today. 20 of the top speakers in our genre are going to be there. And I guarantee you won't be disappointed. Yeah, um, I saw some really good people on there, and some some new people that I started looking at some of their work. That was um, oh, fresh stuff, fresh. Stuff. Yeah. yeah, a lot of stuff happening. So, yeah. Okay, well, uh, guys, uh, after uh, Brooks is done uh, with his next three hours here, I want you to pop on over to the website and. Uh, Hit that members tab and listen to the second hour. And uh, condemnation without investigation is the height of ignorance, and we love you guys. Night, night.